We prefer to take the Lord's Supper this morning. I'd like to read a little passage from Corinthians, the left chapter, starting in verse 23. The Apostle Paul said, For I received the Lord from the Lord, that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was prayed, took bread, and he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in the moment to me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, and the Father, in heaven, we thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us. We pray that, Father, that you'll help us to grow in knowledge of you in your word and spirit and wisdom, that we might truly understand the gift that you give and the cost that it costs. Help us, Father, to go back to that cross and remember that sacrifice and realize that the debt for our sins was paid there. Help us as we partake of this bread that we might do so in a worthy manner. And remember to you. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> So, I'd like to read a couple of verses from Corinthians, the 16th chapter. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have directed the churches in Galatia, to also you, on the first day of every week, that each of you put aside and save as he may prosper, no collection may be made when I come. We're commanded to give as we've been prospered. I don't know what the price of salvation is would be in monetary value. But I know that as the older you get and the closer to death you get, it's in, you can't put a price on it. The confidence and the satisfaction that you can know that because of that sacrifice, you can face death without fear. Or anything. We need to reach out and be out to other people as much as we can. And the only way we can do that is through the church. The only way the church, the local church, can survive is by our local giving. Let's get a thanks at this time for the offering. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. The many things that we have that we take for granted. 
and help us, Father, to realize that you're the giver of all good gifts. And help us to give back, cheerfully and with a good heart. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Charlie's message this morning will sing song number 666. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood.
And before, uh, uh, as you're turning there, and as we're looking at these scriptures together, uh, I'm always amazed at our Lord Jesus and his awareness of the world around him as he's writing these things. Uh, because he's got, he, he says there in verse 19, and, and it's interesting because we've been looking at, at Matthew, and we're going to go back next week because it's going to be just days before Christmas. But we're going to look at, at the birth of Christ uh, from a biblical standpoint, not because we celebrate Christmas. We'll talk more about that later on, we'll, we'll, and we'll elaborate in more detail. But we're going to go back uh, and talk about that. But as we've looked at this Sermon on the Mount, He's addressed some very, very major issues, and especially when it comes to worship itself. He talks about giving. He talks about praying. He talks about fasting, actually, uh, here in Matthew chapter 6. It's a whole discussion that uh, I chose not to elaborate on at this particular time. But at this point, beginning in verse 19, he says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt. And with thieves break through and steal. But let up yourself treasures in heaven, for neither moth nor rough doth corrupt, and with thieves do not break through nor steal. And then he says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I, I realized as I was preparing this last Sunday, and I've thought about it so many times since I first read this just this past week, how Jesus, who described himself, as the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If you've studied the scriptures, especially the gospel accounts of the, the uh, uh, gospel writers' accounts of the birth of Jesus, you know that Jesus was born uh, to a carpenter's son. There's no uh, 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 as to, the, to, a carp to a carpenter and was the son of a carpenter. Uh, there's no special significance about any of his wealth, never never uh, intimated in any of the writings whatsoever. And yet, if you think about it, he's acutely aware of how we handle our riches. As I was contemplating these things, I've been privileged to travel a lot. And I've witnessed poverty, true poverty, in several parts of our world. But when Jesus was talking about rich and how they are impacted, how they impact others. There was no bourgeoisie. Everybody was either poor or wealthy. And yet, in our country, there's a larger middle class, if you will, than there is poor or wealthy. And so, as I was thinking about this, another thought came to my mind. It's kind of relative, isn't it? When I went to the Ukraine for the first time in, in 1994, and then went back for the next three years, and then went back in 2014, and I was telling Sister Cindy this story. I'll never forget it. Uh, Diane and, and, uh, was pregnant with Jacob at the time while we were over there. And constantly uh, we were using uh, a taxi cabs. And the last day that I was there, we had this young man. He was 20 years of age. Uh, and uh, his name was Vitalik. And a uh, very, very nice young man. Very in college, very uh, studious and what have you. <clears throat> but I noticed that most of the, all of their taxi cabs were older. And most of them had a stick shift transmission. <clears throat> and most of them, rather than use the ignition to start their car, they would park their vehicle on a hill, and they would match the clutch and let it roll down the hill, pop the clutch, and drive away. <clears throat> well, I know a little bit about mechanics, and that's not necessarily the best way to, to start a vehicle, but it might be the easiest for them. So I looked at Vitalik, and I said, Vitalik, why do they always pop their clutch to start their car? He's in the front seat because he's translating and sitting next to the driver. He turns around and looks at me and he says, what's a clutch? <laughs> it just, it just dumbfounded me. You know, I've been working on cars since I was a teenager. And back in my day, and all of you guys as I look around, you learned to drive with a stick shift. And you knew that the clutch was on the left, the brake was on the right, and the pedal was next to that. But anyway, <clears throat> I said, Vitalik. You're 20 years old, and you don't know what a clutch is? That amazes me. He had the greatest comeback I've never forgotten in my, since that day, 1994. He said, it amazes me that you have four cars. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about the retaliation. You're talking about the response. It's beyond. And so 
Suffice it to say, so most of the world, and, and I'm looking at Mike back there because Mike has, has spent a lot of time with Lovey. He understands some of this. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, to the most of the world, we are rich. And so it's relative. See, we, we look at, 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 at wealth and rich as being just those that make more money than we do for the most part, all right? Or, or have a, a higher income. But in actuality, many of us are rich. And so as he makes this statement, and I'm thinking about this, you ever thought about how often Jesus addresses the rich and actually makes comments about them? And uh, in case you haven't, you can take notes, okay? Because I have. All right, I've taken the time. Probably one of my favorites, and I actually posted it there in the bulletin to be our, our, uh, uh, our scripture to read for a while, is Luke 9, 25. What did it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I wrote this down for a little bit later on. My, my oldest son, CJ, when he was a teenager, uh, as you, you recall, Nike was a big thing. Their, their, their T-shirts, their, uh, uh, their shoes, their, their, their running shoes, their tennis shoes, whatever. Uh, he had a shirt, I'll never forget it, forgotten it, that said, he that dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> he still dies, doesn't he? So no matter how many toys that we accumulate during the course of our lifetime, and, and, and James would suggest that those things that we accumulate, a matter of fact, maybe you've gotten the book or seen the book, heard about the book, a brother by the name of B.P. Black wrote an entire book on this particular discussion. And you know what the name of his book was? Rust as a Witness. He says that the, the, the things that we've accumulated that will rust and there will be a witness to God as to the things that are most significant in our life. It's not to say, brethren, that being wealthy in and of itself is a sin. And I want to talk about that for a minute before we go any farther. My first church, uh, and, and, and I actually told Abby about this a little, uh, uh, I think just this past week. My first church was Vero Beach, Florida. And one of our deacons was a man by the name of Bob Brack. Back in the 70s, long before we had uh, 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 Equifax and Experian and TRW, there were individual credit bureaus. And Bob Brackett owned several of them up and down the east coast of Florida. He was already a very, very self-made man, lived in what we would consider a mansion at that time. And, uh, well, let me just let's back up for a moment. One of the, uh, the teachers at our school uh, maybe some of you all have heard of him, was named Nat Cooper. He was actually from Ireland, but had been down in South Florida and eventually had made it out to Sunset School of Preaching. His entire compensation for, because most people don't know this, but the schools of preaching especially, the teachers have to raise, raise their own income. They're not paid by the school because most of the schools are, are, are actually somehow or other uh, addressed to uh, the local congregation there. Uh, but his entire compensation came from Bob Brack. Not only that, but there was a man by the name of Cornelius George and the island of Antigua down, down the Caribbean who had four children. All of Cornelius' income and all four of his children went to Harding University without an expense of their own because Bob Brack had paid for all of his kids. The library at Harding University is called Brackett Library because Bob Brackett donated one and a half million dollars to that library. On one single occasion, Brother Bob Brackett donated 12 million dollars to Harding College. Now can you say that Bob Brackett is sinning because he's wealthy? I think if you use that wealth the right way, and of course you compliment and you glorify God in the process. That's exactly what God wants each and every one of us to do. His concern, and, and as I said, there's so many different places that we actually talk about it here in the scriptures. Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. And it's a really good example. Do you remember where this guy said, you know what? Got my barns all full. 
I think what I, I'm paraphrasing. I think what I'll do is I'll just tear those barns down and I'll build me some bigger barns. And once those bigger barns are full, then I will eat, drink, and I will be merry. I've always thought about this because we're warned, especially back in, in, in uh, Matthew 5 that we just recently studied, that we don't call another man a fool. But we can say, and especially Jesus can say, thou foolish one. And that's what he was saying here in Luke 16. You know what Jesus said to this man? Thou, thou fool, this day is thy soul required of thee. And then, who shall all of these things be? Back to that Nike thing, all right? It's not worth it to put all of our emphasis on the collection of wealth and leave God out of the picture or not put, if you will, especially emphasis on God. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus addresses a man that we now refer to as the rich young ruler. And in that context, he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, it's just like all of the other times when someone, uh, and I can think of several right off the top of my head, but someone would approach Jesus, Nicodemus at night, for instance, the woman of the well, on and on it goes, okay? Uh, but as, they came, uh, as he came and he asked him that, Jesus said, you know the commandments, and he started to quote them, especially the Ten Commandments found in, in Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> and the young man says, all of these have I done since my youth up. And Jesus perceived that this man was very wealthy. And he said, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And the Bible says that this man went away very sorrowful because he was very wealthy. He did not want to give up his possessions at the prospect of of actually uh, having salvation and being with God in heaven. He, he made a choice, gave, Jesus gave it to him. Mentioned uh, uh, Cornelius George. That uh, same island of Antigua, there was a brother. There used to be, I don't think it exists anymore, but there used to be a school down in San Juan, Puerto Rico called Caribbean Christian College. And many of our, our brethren that actually ended up in that part of the known world, uh, I, I've been to several months around Antigua, uh, 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 Barbados, uh, these are different places, Trinidad, Tobago, those are places that I've actually done, done work with uh, as far as on the islands, what have you. But at each of these islands, they were trained by, by uh, this particular school. And these people, uh, this brother that had moved, that was trained there to, uh, at that school and was a native of one of the islands, had moved to Antigua. He found a house to make use as a church building. And while he was there and the congregation started to grow, he didn't have any pews. He actually sold his car to buy the lumber to build the pews to start that building, to start that church. Whether that's a sacrifice. That's what God and it's what Jesus had talked about there in the, the rich young ruler uh, and, and the emphasis that is there in that particular case. Uh, one, one final passage uh, and it's probably the most prominent that we all recognize very, very quickly. It's found in, in Luke, the 16th chapter, and it actually begins at verse 19. And I went back this morning to just key in on some key passages there in that context. But it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, and in this particular case, and as I mentioned earlier in the sermon, something that is really, really dynamic to me is how acutely aware Jesus was of how that people allow their wealth to intervene with their spirituality uh, because they just, in many, many cases, in many, many cases, come to a point where, where they become self-sufficient and they have no need for God. That's, of course, the, the very, very power of the point that Jesus is making. But as we read this, and, and I've studied it so many different times, and it's probably the classic example to give us an idea of what happens after death and uh, when the decision is made. And, you know, and, uh, there are many people that have different kinds of ideas about uh, uh, where the soul goes, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you look at Luke chapter 16, especially beginning with verse 19, uh, you, you find out that... that uh, 
uh, and, uh, the, the, that Lazarus actually went into Abraham's bosom, whereas the Bible says, and I was using the King James Version, I don't know what some of the other versions say, but the Bible says that he went into hell. Now, as I said, there's a whole discussion, a depth of discussion about uh, paradise as opposed to heaven and Gehenna as opposed to hell. Uh, and, and one of them re refers to a temporary dwelling place as to the other a permanent dwelling place where there is no return, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and these types of things. But this rich man was so condescending, so arrogant, so pious that here's this man that just wanted the crumbs that fell from his table and he would not allow that to happen. And so when the rich man dies, obviously we know the story, he's in torment, he's asking that someone go back and warn his brothers as to what's impending if they don't turn their life around. Very, very powerful lesson about being prepared. But the whole gist of it is here, is how we use our money. And whether it's to glorify God or just to make ourselves happier. Uh, I have a, 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 an ex-cousin-in-law, if you can allow me to use that term, he's married to my cousin. And he became very, very wealthy. He lives in Jacksonville to this day, Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, those that know him well say that his net worth right now is about $450 million, uh, which is just a good phenomenon. When he divorced my cousin back in 1988, he was, he was as sad as she was about the divorce. And he said to her, I think I'm going to go out and buy me another Mercedes. I think that'll make me happy. It's sad. It's really, really sad when we get into that kind of a mindset to where that's what we're thinking about as far as the wealth and what it will do for us. James chapter 2, uh, and, and, and I certainly implore you to start reading it in chapter 1, uh, uh, chapter 2 beginning with verse 1, because he talks about how that we deal with one another based on somebody being wealthy as opposed to someone who's really very, very poor. And, and he, he gets very emphatic about how that we if you will, uh, co-mingle, and uh, as opposed to separating those that are not as wealthy as us. So we have to be cautious about those things as well. As we've listened to this lesson, thought about our own particular life, the relationship that we have in it. If there's someone here this morning that need, needs to give their heart or their life back to Jesus, we invite you to come all together and stand alongside. Mm -hmm.